Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Cycling Insider. In this episode, something a little bit different than usual. So you see, recently I read this very interesting book called The Yellow Jersey Club, Inside the Minds of the Tour de France Winners, written by Edvard Pickering. So it's a very interesting book, and in this episode I wanted to present you two stories from this uh, book. So the book uh, basically talks about the Tour de France winners from 1975 all the way to 2014, and for the each of their winning Tour de France years, it gives a specific story, the story that kind of shaped the winners of that year's Tour de France. So it's a very interesting, you know, story about 21 Tour de France winners. So the first story I want to tell you from this book, it is about uh, Alberto Contador, and the year is 2007 and also 2009 season. So you probably know Alberto Contador as the winner of uh, two times Tour de France, once he has won Giro d'Italia, and also he has won three times uh, Vuelta España. So Alberto Contador, definitely one of the greatest uh, bike racers ever. But you see, Contador has also been stripped of the more overall titles than any other cyclist, of course, except Lance Armstrong. So Contador has been disqualified from his 2010 victory at the Tour de France because he was tested positive for Clan Buterol. And then also in 2011, he was stripped of his titles at the Giro d'Italia because, again, this was the retroactively, you know, applied uh, from 2010. So now you can think about Contador as the winner of six or eight uh, Grand Tours. Of course, along with that, he has won multiple times Tour of the Basque Country and also two times Paris-Nice uh, titles. When you look at uh, Contador's career, the scandal has always followed his career uh, from the beginning. He was also the first rider that faced uh, Lance Armstrong truly in the competition when Lance uh, decided to return, and we all know how that uh, finished. And also the Contador uh, during his career has refused to give his DNA during the Operación Puerto, which was the big anti-doping you know, operation, because Contador was claiming, well, I'm innocent, therefore I don't need to give my DNA to establish if I was the, uh, the customer of Eufemio Fuentes. When you look at Contador's career as the Tour de France rider, he started in 2005 when he was only 22 years old and he finished uh, 31st at that Tour de France, which was pretty respectable in my book. But the key Contador, when you think about him, this is like two main events. That's 2007 season and also 2009 season. So if we go back to the 2007 season, Contador has just uh, joined um, the Discovery Channel team, which was then managed by Johan Brunil, which was also the big boss of Lance Armstrong during all his uh, seven Tour de France wins. And when Contador joined Discovery Channel in 2007, of course they were looking for a new Tour de France winner, and luckily for them, uh, Contador has delivered and has managed to win that 2007 Tour de France. Of course it wasn't easy, he almost lost it in that final time trial when he just managed to be better than Cadell Evans uh, and uh, Levi Lapheimer. I think the difference was 23 seconds between Contador and Cadell Evans uh, at the end. So he just managed to keep on to his lead and win the 2007 uh, Tour de France. Then going into the 2008 season, Discovery Ch Channel uh, fell apart as the team and everything was transferred to the Astana team. So both Contador and Johan Brunil transferred there, but uh, in 2008 season he didn't ride Tour de France because they were forbidden from riding Tour de France from all the doping scandals. So, and then there was this huge news about Lance Armstrong deciding to return to the professional cycling in 2009 and of course joining the Astana team. So now you can imagine there was Lance Armstrong, Johan Brunil and Alberto Contador in the same team. So definitely that was the clash of two titans in 2009 season at the Tour de France. Because imagine they had to decide who is going to be the leader of the team. So if you 
you look at the Contador's kind of other achievements, he has, uh, as I said, uh, won the Giro d'Italia in 2011, which was also stripped uh, of his title because of, again, the Clan Buterol case in 2010 Tour de France. And also, I have to say that in 2013, he was uh, easily beaten by Chris Froome. And we can say that the peak of Contador's career was this kind of 2009-2010 season. So if we go a bit back on that uh, astonishing 2009 season, this is a definitely season that shaped Contador properly as a Grand Tour uh, winner. As I said, in that uh, 2009 Tour, he was on the same team with uh, Lance Armstrong. And it was clearly that Contador was the strongest rider. And I would say the second strongest rider in that Tour was Andy Schleck. And then I would put Lance Armstrong, Bradley Wiggins, and Frank Schleck and uh, Nibali in the kind of third level of the riders at that uh, Tour de France. But of course, there was this ongoing soap opera between Contador and Lance Armstrong. And there were a few very interesting moments from that tour that always stuck in mind for all the people who watched it. So first of all, uh, Astana was, when they were picking their leader, they were still not decided, but it was clear that Contador was kind of winning the physical battle against uh, Lance Armstrong. So in the opening uh, time trial in Monaco, he put already 22 seconds into Armstrong. And then uh, basically what, uh, happened was a very interesting situation where on one of the stages there was a split uh, in the crosswinds because of the crosswinds and the 27 riders finished about uh, 41 seconds ahead of the next group and of course Armstrong was in that first group and Contador got caught behind and lost a lot of time uh, to Lance Armstrong but then an interesting event happened that um, when they had a team time trial Astana uh, almost won it and they came in zero point I mean they came 0 0.22 seconds of putting uh, Armstrong into the yellow jersey during this uh, team time trial this was almost a decisive moment for Contador where he avoided uh, Lance Armstrong taking the yellow jersey for 0 0.22 seconds but then of course Contador has killed the race uh, when they reached the Verbier putting almost 43 seconds into Antti Schleck and a minute and a half into Armstrong and this was only done in about 6 uh, kilometers. So Contador definitely stamped his authority there. And of course uh, he put a further minute and a half into Armstrong in the Annecy time trial and then basically the race was over and everybody knew that Contador is the winner of this 2009 uh, Tour de France. Of course after that Tour de France both Contador and Armstrong just said that they couldn't work with each other and their friendship is basically over. But I have to say that um, when you think about Contador, he's definitely a hard case. He's, you know, definitely stubborn, but he can definitely take the pressure on. And he is, I would say, the only guy who managed to beat Lance Armstrong in a proper Tour de France competition when Lance Armstrong also came very prepared. Also, I have to say that since 2009, uh, Contador's performance started dropping. He had another excellent year in 2010, but again, we know he was stripped of that title. And uh, to call the Contador the best uh, Grand Tour rider of his era is definitely you know, a statement about Contador, but also you can think about that um, era as the statement of also the, the era that he was riding in. Another story I want to tell you from this book is the story about uh, 2013 season and the main character is uh, Chris uh, Froome. So now we know that Chris Froome has already won four times Tour de France, but in those times Chris Froome was only getting a chance to even try to win uh, Tour de France. So as the book mentions, I mean, there's a lot of... Um, commentators who have made an observation that there's this uh, main contradiction with uh, with Chris Froome. Well, on one hand, he's uh, very polite and kind of uh, adjusted, but on the other hand, it's impossible to see behind his uh, polished uh, exterior. There's always this big question, did Chris Froome attack his teammate Bradley Wiggins in 2012 Tour de France when Bradley Wiggins was in yellow? 
which is always a very interesting story about uh, Froome's uh, career. Of course, in that famous stage, uh, going to La Tussière, uh, Bradley Wiggins was in yellow, and Chris Froome, as his teammate, was uh, approximately two minutes to zero seven behind Bradley Wiggins, where Cadell Evans was second, just under two minutes. And then what happened is just uh, astonishing. So Chris Froome was pulling Wiggins back up to the Nibali's group, and as soon as the contact was made, Chris Froome decided to accelerate. It was obvious that only Nibali and Pinot followed, and then Van de Broek, but Wiggins couldn't follow, and he was definitely distanced by this uh, Froome's move. It was funny that uh, French television then noticed this, and they immediately started saying that there's a huge acceleration from Froome, and Wiggins is not with him, basically Wiggins has stalled, oh la la, what's going on here? In that moment, uh, Sky Manager, uh, Sean Yates, who was in the car, basically told the story that he quickly went onto the microphone and said, Froomey, what the, you know, F you are doing here and what are you playing here? Because he made it clear that this was not the game plan for uh, Chris uh, Froome. Later, after all was said and done and Bradley Wiggins won that uh, Tour de France in 2012, uh, Froome basically summed up the whole situation by saying that... Uh, he was pulling, pulling Wiggins back up to Nibali's group with about five kilometers to go. And then he said, I was feeling great. Nibali was spent and Pinot was spent and also Van de Broek was spent. Brad, Brad Wiggins, was spent, but he had a teammate to pull him along. That's why I attacked. At that also, at that moment, uh, Wiggins was kind of threatening that he will go home and leave Tour de France, but luckily they convinced him to stay, and as they say, the rest is history, he managed to win it. But you see, the story about Froome has also the two main events that kind of culminated in his, I would say, frustration with the 2012 Tour de France. So we have to go back to 2011 Vuelta España, where Froome was so strong and riding excellent, again helping Bradley Wiggins, where Bradley was the leader and he was uh, in, the, in the leader's jersey, but uh, since Froome was riding so strong, he managed to came second overall, and he was only 13 seconds behind that year's winner, which was Juan Jose Cobo, and Wiggins finished in third. So this was the first moment when Froome, was a bit disappointed that they didn't let him, you know, ride and win that Vuelta because he was helping Wiggins, he lost it and finished second. But clearly he was much stronger. Also, the second point of Froome's frustration uh, came in that 2012 Tour de France when he lost uh, 1 minute and 25 seconds in one of the first stages uh, because he had a puncture about 10 kilometers to go and nobody from Team Sky waited for him except uh, Richie Porte, and then when, of course, when they had to chase the big group, he lost 1 minute 25, and he was so kind of disappointed that nobody waited and uh, helped for him. And that's why that famous attack went on on La Tussière later in the race, where he just wanted to prove and kind of delete that 1 minute 25 uh, time. Of course, the, the famous writer David Walsh also wrote about Chris Froome that you soon learn not to confuse politeness with softness. There was, a Walsh added, a corner of Froome's soul where you can find granite. Of course, when uh, Chris Froome uh, joined the Team Sky, his numbers, his power output was so impressive that there's a story that uh, Bobby Ulich thought that uh, Chris Froome's power meter was broken and it's not showing the, the correct numbers. But then we saw in 2013 a new Chris Froome, which was totally invincible and uh, dominant. And of course, when you think about Chris Froome, as I say, we know him now as the four times Tour de France winner, we know him as the two times Vuelta España winner and also Giro d'Italia winner, and he has, you know, two-time Olympic medalist, so absolutely astonishing cyclist, one of the greatest in the history of cycling. But of course, there's always this story about Chris Froome that for every good year, 
there always seems to be some kind of uh, payback in the form of his bad luck or illness. And later in his career, we know about that the horrible crash that he had, and he's still uh, trying to recover from uh, this uh, crash. So, in a summary, I would strongly recommend you to have a look at this uh, The Yellow Jersey Club book by Edward Pickering, which, because it's just a great um, insight into the kind of key stories of the careers of the Tour de France winners all the way from 1975 to 2014. So, I think this is going to be it for today, a little bit different than usual. Let me know in the comments below if you like it, and if you do, keep on watching, keep on liking, and as always, I will see you soon in the next episode. Cheers!